to be in Job 42 today, if you want to start to turn there in your Bibles. And uh, as you do that, I'd like to lead us in a quick time of prayer, if we could. Father, we come into your presence and just proclaim here at the start what a joy it is. What a joy it is to be here today in your house and to have the opportunity to open your word and to celebrate with your people all the amazing things that you have done and continue to do to celebrate the amazing grace you have brought into our lives. Father, I pray that we would never be quick to rush into these times or fail to remember that this is a special time. This is a sacred place. Father, we are a set-apart people who exist solely for your pleasure and your purpose. Lord, help us not to forget that. Lord, we pray that even now you would speak. Even now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you're glad to be here today, say amen. Good, good. We've been doing this study through the book of Job. Um, For those of you who haven't been with us this summer, maybe you're here for the first time, or maybe you've just been out for a few weeks, I want to kind of do a a quick recap. This is actually part two of uh, what we did last time we were all together. But uh, throughout this study, we've, we've heard a lot of people speak. We've heard Job speak. We've heard Job's wife speak. We've heard the devil speak. We've heard Job's friends speak. But throughout most of this book, God has been silent. And Job has lamented over that multiple times. On multiple occasions, Job has cried out in an effort to get an audience with God. Last time we were together, we went through some of those verses. Last time we were together, I asked you, I I said, how many of you have ever felt like that? How many of you have ever felt like Job at some point in time in your life where you wanted God to speak? You, want, you just wanted God to speak to you. You wanted God to, to speak to your circumstance. You wanted God to speak to your issues. You wanted God to speak to your relationships. I asked you, how many of you have ever wanted to hear God speak in the middle of your sorrow and grief? How many of you have ever wanted to hear God just whisper in your ear as you were struggling with your own guilt and shame? And to no surprise at all, everybody raised their hand, because we've all, at some point in our life, wanted to hear God speak. It's a natural thing. On some level, again, we can all relate to Job, because Job's story is our story. We relate so well to this, because we've all been in a similar situation as Job, wanting to hear him speak. And it's natural and normal to want to hear God speak. So many times when we talk about God speaking, we we focus on how God speaks. And I told you last time that I think instead of focusing on the how, we needed to focus on the who. Because God can speak in innumerable ways, in in infinite numbers of ways God can speak to us. It's, It's the how that we get hung up on, but it's the who that's the most important. The big idea then, and the big idea again for today is this, God still speaks, we need to know that. God still speaks, I firmly believe that. And then part two of this big idea is, forget about the how for a moment, and focus on the who. Forget about how God speaks, and let's look at who God speaks to. Last time we were together, I I made this point, and I want to make it again today as clearly as I can. I want to assure you, and I want to be clear, that God can speak to anyone he chooses to speak to. I'm not in any way trying to say God can only speak to you if you have these six characteristics, or God will only speak to people who have these six characteristics. That's not the point of of these messages. God can speak to anybody. God can speak to anybody, anywhere, at any time. He can speak to whoever he chooses to. I fully acknowledge that and agree with that. But, but what I'm also saying is this, as we look through the Bible, as we look through the scriptures, there is a pattern, and there is an overwhelming, obvious set of characteristics that mark the men and women of God 
who he chooses to speak to. Last time we talked about the first three characteristics. We, we said God speaks to those who are silent. God speaks to those who submit to his authority. And we said God speaks to those who are willing to surrender to his will. We were in Job 38 last time where God spoke to Job here at the end of the book. He asked Job 77 questions, specific questions, questions that, by the way, had nothing to do with his situation or circumstance. Questions, by the way, that didn't answer any of the questions Job had about his situation and circumstance. Today, I want us to jump to chapter 42. And and here's where we pick up after God has finished speaking and he's finished asking Job all those questions And Job replies, and then God replies back and speaks to Job's friend. So here's our main text for today. Job 42, 1 through 6. Let's read that first. It says, Then Job replied to the Lord, I know that you can do anything, and no plan of yours can be thwarted. You asked, Who is this who conceals my counsel with ignorance? Surely I spoke about things I did not understand, things too wondrous for me to know. You, you said, listen now, and I will speak. When I question you, you will inform me. I had heard reports about you, but now my eyes have seen you. Listen to what Job says in verse 6. He says, therefore, I reject my words, and I am sorry for them. I am dust and ashes. I am sorry for everything I said. Have you ever been wrong about something? How many of you have ever been wrong about something? If you didn't raise your hand, you were just wrong about something. (laughs) Parents, parents, let me just ask you this. Parents, say amen, parents, if your kids have ever been wrong about something. That's a pretty strong amen. Kids, say amen if your parents have ever been wrong about something. Pretty good little amen there. Ladies. Ladies, say amen if your man has ever been wrong about something. Amen. Got a couple of multiple amens on that one. <laughs> Didn't say amen for every time, just one amen will do. Men, be careful. <laughs> I know we're treading on dangerous ground. But men, say amen if your woman... Beat me to the punch. Say amen if, if, if your woman has ever been wrong about something. Never. I got to never. You know, isn't it funny? The, the parents are like, amen. And the kids are like, amen. And the ladies are like, amen, 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 amen. And the men are like, amen. <laughs> hmm, something, something telling in that little test. So let's start with the good news. I like starting with good news. There's good news here at the beginning as we look at this text. Catch this, church. This is important. I want you to catch this. This is important. God speaks to people who are wrong. Isn't that good news? You don't have to be right to hear from God. We see that even clearer as we move deeper into the text. Look at Job 42, 7 through 9. Just pick it up where we left off. After the Lord had finished speaking with Job... He said to Eliphaz, I'm angry with you and your two friends, for you have not spoken the truth about me as my servant Job has. Now take seven bulls and seven rams, go to my servant Job and offer burnt offerings for yourselves. Then my servant Job will pray for you. I will surely accept his prayer and not deal with you as your folly deserves. For you have not spoken the truth about me as my servant Job has Then Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar went and did as the Lord had told them, and the Lord accepted Job's prayer. God goes to these friends who've been talking through this whole deal, and he says, you've been wrong. You've been wrong about me through this entire deal. You've been wrong about Job in this entire deal. He tells these guys, these guys who've been beating Job up, telling Job he's gotten what he deserved, telling Job surely he has secret sins and that's why God is punishing him, giving Job all this bad theology and bad advice all this time, God goes to them and speaks to them, even though they were wrong. And God says, you guys need to go to Job now 
and ask him to pray for you and I'll accept his prayer. You know how hard that must have been for those three guys to have to go back to Job and to ask him to pray for them? You know what it's like to be wrong and have to go say you're sorry? You know what it's like to be wrong and have to admit it? It's hard, but they did. And I just say right here at the beginning, praise God, he still speaks even when we're wrong. I think here in these verses, this passage, we see the three other characteristics that define the men and women that God speaks to. For example, point number one, characteristic number four, picking up where we left off last time is this, God speaks to those who sit in humility. He speaks to people who are willing to sit in humility, to humble themselves. We see great humility in the life of Job throughout his entire struggle here in the book of Job. And here near the end, we see the climax of that humility right here in the middle of our text for today in verse 6, where he says, therefore, I reject my words and I'm sorry for them. I am dust and ashes. He says, I humble myself to dust and ashes before you. Last week, we saw Job answer this way when the Lord spoke to him in chapter 40, verses 3 through 5. It says, then Job answered the Lord. He said, I am so insignificant. How can I answer you? I place my hand. He says, I place my hand over my mouth. I've spoken once and I will not reply twice. Now I can add nothing. Great humility in the life of Job. But this humility is not a new thing for Job. This is who Job was. If we had time, we could go and we could read about Job's humility in other places. We could go and read about it in Job 1.1. We could read about it in Job 9.15. We could read about it in Job 10.15. We could read about it in Job 13.15. I know it's a lot of 15s. It's just how they landed. We could go and read about his humility in places like Job chapter 4, verses 3 and 4, and Job 29, 12 through 16, where we see over and over and over again that Job is a man who consistently puts other people before himself. He consistently puts other people above himself. He consistently sits in humility. His friends even point to his humility on multiple occasions. They point to his humility as being one of his greatest traits. One of the greatest things they've seen in his life over and over again throughout the book. They point to this man's humility. He's a humble man. He knows how to sit in humility. I think that's part of the reason God was willing to speak to him. When God comes and speaks to these three friends who've been wrong in Job 42, we see them humble themselves before the Lord as well. They humble themselves before the Lord and they go and do exactly what God tells them to do with the sacrifices and getting Job to pray for them. They go and admit they were wrong. That takes a humble person. Job's friends aren't perfect people. And Job's friends certainly failed Job and certainly failed God in this chapter of their lives. But, but we have to remember they're not bad people. We have to remember, they didn't have all the information. They didn't get to hear the conversation that we got to hear in the first few chapters of of the book of Job where these conversations are happening in eternity between the forces of good and evil. They didn't hear all of that. These are just three friends who didn't see or hear or know any of that trying to make sense of some very difficult questions and struggling with some very difficult problems. I honestly don't think they were bad people or trying to do bad things. And here at the end, we see signs of great humility in their lives as they admit they're wrong. And they they admit they're wrong willingly and they admit they're wrong quickly. They don't don't mess around with that. The Bible has a lot to say about humility. We don't have time to get to all of it today. But I, but I, I love a couple of these examples that I want to share with you. I love, for example, in Acts chapter 20, verses 18 and 19, Paul talks about um, us as believers serving the Lord with great humility. Look at this verse. He says, when they came to him, he said to them, you know, from the first day I set foot in Asia, how I was with you the whole time. Look at verse 19, serving the Lord with all humility, with tears and during the trials that came to me through the plots of the Jews. We're supposed to serve the Lord with humility. It's supposed to be a part of our service to God. 
James chapter four, verse 10 says, humble yourselves before the Lord. You can't say it any plainer. It says, humble yourself before the Lord and he will exalt you. To the Colossian believers, Paul, Paul wrote to them in Colossians chapter three, verse 14, and, and he, he talks to them about putting some stuff on. He says, you, we need to put on compassion and we need to put on kindness. We need to put on humility, he says. We need to put on gentleness and patience and a slew of other things. But humility is a part of that. Jesus, in Matthew chapter 23, verse 12, says, whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. As, as I was considering this point over about the last month, preparing to preach this message, just letting this roll around in my heart and my mind and praying over it and searching the scriptures on it, just asking God to help me in my own personal area of this, this in my own life, as I was praying through it and going through that process, um, the Lord laid five things on my heart that I think are, are keys to living in humility. Because I think if we're honest, we're not real good at humility, most of us. So God put five things on my heart, and, and these are characteristics I see in people who have the characteristic of humility. We're not going to spend time, a lot of time on each of them. We're not going to go through a bunch of scriptures on each of them, though there are dozens of scriptures we could point out for each of them. Five keys if you want to write them down. We're going to move quickly here. Number one, you have to be a patient person. The first key is patience. If you're going to be somebody who sits in humility and remains in a posture of humility with God, I think you have to learn to be patient. You have to be so confident in God that you're comfortable waiting for God to act. You have to be comfortable waiting for God to show up. You have to be comfortable waiting for God to speak. If you're going to sit in humility, you have to be patient. Because if you get anxious, your humility goes by the wayside really quickly. Number two, you have to be a person of prayer. Humble people are prayerful people. Humble people are prayerful people. And as I was thinking about that, you know what dawned on me? I have never left a season on my knees in prayer, puffed up and filled with pride. Have you? Have you ever left a, a season of serious prayer with God prideful? I have never walked away from a time of prayer feeling like I'm worthy, feeling like I'm sufficient, feeling like I'm superior, feeling like I'm entitled. I've never walked away from a time of prayer feeling like nothing changed. When you sit with God in prayer, it humbles you. And sitting in humility means spending time with God in prayer. I think sitting in humility, there's this third thing. You have, to, you have to learn to be at peace if you're going to be a person of great humility. You might also use the word contentment there, but you have to just be okay. Just learning to live at, at peace and in peace with what God's will is. Learning to, to be able to pray and sincerely and genuinely mean it, Lord, not my will, but yours be done. To just have that peace in your life to know that God's got it. It's hard to live in a posture of humility if you're always anxious and worried and not at peace with who God is and what God's doing. This fourth one's important, and it's one we, we frequently forget, and it's one God just spoke over and over and over in my heart about. It's the word praise. We've got to be people of praise. Being the kind of person who wants to praise God and be with God produces a humbleness in your life. Much like our, our times of prayer, when I leave a, a great time of praising God, I never leave that time of praising God impressed with myself. I always leave that time in awe of who God is. I'm humbled in those moments. And then here's the fifth one. I think we have to be people who find pleasure in his presence. Do you long for God? God. I mean, do you thirst for him? Do you have an unquenchable desire to just be in his presence? Are you happy when you're with God? You see, when your relationship with the Father is one that produces pleasure in your life, so much pleasure that you long for those next precious moments with him, when you find great pleasure just being in his presence, I, I'm not talking about 
great pleasure when he speaks to you. I'm, I'm not talking about great pleasure when he blesses you and answers a prayer. I'm not talking about great pleasure when you get something from him. I'm just talking about pleasure being in his presence. When you have a relationship with the Lord that is filled with great pleasure because you're just in his holy presence, you're going to find that there is a very natural and a very powerful humility that rises up in your life. I do really believe that God still speaks. And I really believe that we need to focus less on the how he speaks and more on the who he speaks to. And we need to remember he speaks to people who are humble. Psalms 138 verses 5 and 6. I want you to hear this. You might even want to underline this in your Bible. It says this in verse 5, They will sing of the Lord's ways, for the Lord's glory is great. Look at verse 6. Though the Lord is exalted, he takes note of the humble, but he knows the haughty from a distance. God takes note of the humble, and he speaks to them. Point number two for today is this. The fifth characteristics of the kind of people God speaks to is this. He speaks to those who show reverence, who understand what reverence is. Now, reverence is one of these big words, but but it really means something very simple. Reverence is about showing respect and giving honor where it's due. That's all it is. Showing respect and giving honor where it's due. And the Bible is full of things we as believers are called and commanded to show reverence to. Whole other list of blanks there. We're going to go really quick. You're going to have to go back and study these on your own, okay? But, and these are just a sample. This isn't everything we're called to give reverence to. I'm just trying to show you that we as the people of God are called to be a reverent people. So we're called, for example, to give great reverence and respect to God. That's the first blank there. Hebrews 12, 28 through 29, Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful by it we may serve God acceptably with reverence and awe. For God is a consuming fire. A lot of other verses about us giving reverence to God, but but we're called to do that. Be a people who revere God and respect God. We're called to give reverence to Jesus. Ephesians 5.21 says, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. I don't submit to you out of reverence to you. You don't submit to me out of reverence for me. We submit to each other out of a reverence for Christ. Because we're called to revere him, to respect him. It's the same with the Holy Spirit. Number three there, if you're writing them in the blanks. We should give reverence to the Holy Spirit, Ephesians 4.30. And don't grieve the Holy Spirit, it says. Because you're sealed by him for the day of redemption. We're supposed to revere him, not grieve him. Church, this can be hard. This can be a tough one. Students, listen to me. I know this can be tough, but we're supposed to revere our parents. Exodus 20, 12, 10 commandments. Honor your father and your mother. It doesn't say honor your good fathers and your good mothers. It says honor your father and your mother so that you may have a long life in the land the Lord your God is giving you. You're supposed to revere them and respect them. And that means different things in different situations. I get it. But we are called as Christians to have reverence for what it is to be a parent. And many of us don't start revering our parents until we become parents. And then that reverence starts. What if we started with that early on? God calls us to do it. We're supposed to have reverence for God's house, for God's sanctuary, for God's church. This this isn't just a building. This is God's house. Leviticus 26.2 says, keep my Sabbaths and revere my sanctuary. I am the Lord. Our body is called a temple of God, right? A sanctuary for the Lord. We're supposed to take care of it. We're supposed to revere the commandments of God's holy word. It's the next blank. Psalms 119.97 to be a good example of some scriptures that go with that. For the psalmist says, how I love your instruction. It is my meditation all day long. He had a reverence for it. He was going to follow it and obey it. This is a good one for the culture we live in. 
We're supposed to revere the holy union of marriage. That's something that, that, that we're supposed to have reverence and respect for. Hebrews 13, 4 says marriage is to be honored by all and the marriage bed kept undefiled because God will judge the sexually immoral and adulterers. We're supposed to revere God's leaders, people God puts in charge of his church. 1 Thessalonians 5, 12 through 13. Now we ask you, brothers and sisters, to give recognition to those who labor among you and lead you in the Lord and admonish you and to regard them very highly in love because of their work. Be at peace among yourselves. We as God's people are supposed to revere life. We're supposed to be people who have respect for life. Psalm 139, 13 through 16, for it was you who created my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I will praise you because I have been remarkably and wondrously made. Your works are wondrous and I know this very well. My bones were not hidden from you when I was made in secret, when I was formed in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw me when I was formless. All my days were written in your book and planned before a single one of them began. If we believe God is the author of life and we believe we are to revere God, then we are to revere the life that he gives us and everybody else. We could keep going, but the point is this. We are called to be a people who show reverence. We are called to be a people who show respect. We are called to be a reverent people. And here's the danger. When we forget that, when we forget that we are supposed to be a reverent people, who have reverence and respect for these things God tells us we should have reverence and respect for, we can very quickly, intentionally or unintentionally, very quickly, we can drift away and end up in a place where it's very hard to hear God speak. If you search through the scriptures, you'll find that God speaks to people who know and value reverence. Let me give you a couple of examples. He told Moses when he approached the burning bush, he said, hey, you're standing on holy ground. Take those sandals off. And Moses did it because he was a man who understood what, what reverence was. Abraham fell face down in Genesis 17.3 out of reverence for the presence of God. Isaiah exclaimed, woe is me for I am lost. For I am a man of unclean lips in Isaiah 6.5 out of reverence for God and the work of God. When Ezekiel encountered the glory of the Lord, he fell face down and it says in Ezekiel 128, he trembled in God's presence. Upon receiving a vision, Daniel said, my face turned deathly pale and I was helpless in Daniel 10.8. When, when the angel Gabriel came to Mary, and announced that Mary was going to bear the Son of God. Mary, Mary, how did she respond? Did Mary say, oh, I figured he'd pick me because I'm such a good person? Did, 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 did Mary say, whoa, I won the cosmic lottery. Look how lucky I am. No. She was a reverent person. How did she respond? She said, I am the Lord's servant May your word be fulfilled. Luke 138, go look it up. Reverence, respect. After witnessing the miraculous catch of fish, the apostle Peter, he falls to his knees and he says to Jesus, he says, go away from me because I am a sinful man, Lord. Reverence, he understood it. Luke 5.8. You can go to Luke chapter 7, verses 37 through 38, and, and we find a woman in, in these verses, a woman who is known for her sinful past, her grievously sinful past, who comes and she anoints the feet of Jesus with expensive perfume, and she washes his feet with her tears and her hair. That's respect and reverence. She understood it. In the book of Revelation, when John encounters the risen Christ, it says he fell at his feet as though dead in reverence. And these are just a small sample of the men and women of God that God speaks to. 
But, but you notice they all have this in common. They are people who understand what reverence and respect are. Church, God still speaks. And he speaks to those who value and understand reverence. When you have time today, go home and read the main text that we started with out of Job. And you're going to notice that Job and Job's friends, when they hear God speak, they have great reverence for God. God speaks to those who who know what reverence is. Here's the last one. God speaks to those who seek repentance. God speaks to people who seek repentance. I want to end today by driving home the point I briefly mentioned at the beginning. We kind of started with, remember when I said God speaks to people who are wrong and how that's good news for us? You don't have to be right to hear from God. You don't have to be perfect or right for God to speak to you. That's good news because none of us are perfect and none of us are right. See, it's easy for us to read the Bible and it's easy for us to think that God only speaks to people like the Apostle Paul and God only speaks to people like Moses and Mary and John. That God only speaks to people like Isaiah and Ezekiel or Job. The Bible says this about Job. The Bible says that that Job was a man of complete integrity who feared God and turned away from evil. And so we read that and we go, well, yeah, well, of course he spoke to Job. I mean, gosh, he's a guy. I mean, he's a man of complete integrity. That's not me. He's a man who totally feared God. I, I haven't done that in my life. He's a man who turned away from evil. I've embraced it. So sure, God's not going to speak to me. He speaks to people like this. It's easy for us to convince ourselves of that. Because most of us would say, hey, well, we're not in that class. We're not in that category of faithfulness, if you will. So we quickly lose hope that God's ever going to speak to us. But God does speak to people like us. God speaks to people who fail. God speaks to people who fall. God speaks to people who are lost in their sin. And that's great news because Romans 3.23 says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. God speaks to people like that. God speaks to people like you and like me. I want to give you two great examples as we close. The first one is a guy by the name of Manasseh. Many of you may not know Manasseh's story. I'm not going to do a full lesson here on Manasseh, but you need some highlights. You need to understand what a sorry person this guy was. Manasseh became the king of Judah at the age of 12. That's pretty young to become king. He was the son of a really good king. His dad was Hezekiah. And Hezekiah died, and Manasseh at the age of 12 becomes king. And Manasseh would be king for 55 years over Judah. But unlike his father, he didn't follow the ways of God. He wasn't faithful. He wasn't a good king. He wasn't a a, a king that was faithful to God. In fact, it wasn't just that he was not faithful. Manasseh is infamous for his extensive and grievous sins against God and his rebellion away from God. And he didn't just lead himself and his family away from God. He led the entire nation away from God. Manasseh did things like rebuild the high places that his father had destroyed He erected altars to false idols and false gods. He made an Asherah pole, which again, we don't have time for all the history that goes along with that, but really bad, not good. We're we're told in the Bible that Manasseh worshiped not the God of heaven, but it says he worshiped the stars. In 2 Kings chapter 21, it says that Manasseh practiced child sacrifices. This is the guy we're talking about. Late in his life, Manasseh is captured by the Assyrians. And while in captivity, he's suffering greatly. And the Bible tells us that in that captivity and in that great suffering, he humbles himself before the Lord and he repented. And God heard him and God spoke to him and answered his prayers and saved him and brings him back to Jerusalem. I want to read it to you. It's in 2 Chronicles 33. It's powerful. Starting verse 12, it says, When he was in distress, this is in his captivity, he sought the favor of the Lord, his God, and earnestly humbled himself before the God of his ancestors. He prayed to him, 
And the Lord was receptive to his prayer. He granted his request and brought him back to Jerusalem to his kingdom. And then look at this. It says, so Manasseh came to know that the Lord is God. He wasn't a good guy. He wasn't a faithful guy. But he repented and God heard him and God spoke back. I'll give you another good example. This one you're probably more familiar with. A guy by the name of David, King David. The guy that's after God's own heart. Only problem is at one point in his life, he committed adultery. And he didn't just kind of commit adultery. Like it, it was a really bad thing. It involved a murder and deception. I mean, it, it's really wicked stuff. But after all of that, you know what David does? He repents. And the Bible tells us that God forgives him. And then God continues to speak with David, and he continues to use David in marvelous ways, even though he sinned and messed up. It's recorded like this in 2 Samuel 12, 13. It says, David responded to Nathan the prophet. He said, I have sinned against the Lord. And then Nathan replied to David, and the Lord has taken away your sin. You will not die. Church, God still speaks to those who are willing to repent. Job and his friends, go back and read our main text. Job and his friends repent of all the words they've said. They repent of all the bad theology they've spread. They repent of all the nonsense that's come out of their mouths. And I believe that's why God speaks to them. They have a repentant heart. Go back and read Job 42.6. Go back and read Job 42.9. And you're going to see that both Job and his friends expressed sincere repentance to God. Repentance is important. It's not just important to Job or David or Manasseh. It's important to us. The Bible says this about repentance. Peter said in Acts 3.19, he says, Therefore repent and turn back so that your sins may be wiped out. Repentance is important if you want your sins to be washed away. Paul said in Romans 2, 4, he said, or do you despise the riches of his kindness? Do you despise his restraint? Do you despise his patience? Not recognizing that it's God's kindness that is intended to lead you to repentance. John said in 1 John chapter 1, verses 9 and 10, he said, if we confess our sin, if we repent, he is faithful and he is righteous to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But if we say we have not sinned, if we don't repent, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Jesus said in Matthew 4, 17, he said, repent because the kingdom of heaven is near. In Luke 15, 10, Jesus said, there is joy in the presence of God's angels over one sinner who repents. Repentance is important. We've heard what Job said. We've heard what Job's friends said and did. We've seen what Peter said and Paul said. We've seen what Jesus said. Now the question is, what do you say? Are you going to repent of your sins and confess Christ as your Lord and Savior today? Or are you going to continue to turn away from the God who seeks and the God who speaks to sinners like you? Are you going to turn away from the God who sent his one and only son to shed his blood and die on a cross, to speak in the loudest possible way to the entirety of creation, to speak directly to you and say, this is for you, he's dying for you. Are you going to turn away from that God who speaks. I pray you won't. I pray you'll repent. Let's pray. We're not going to ask you to walk an aisle, raise a hand, stand up. I'm not going to point you out in any way, shape, or form. I'm just going to ask you to answer that question. What about you? If you're still carrying your sin around and you want to repent, you need to repent. If you can feel God's presence in this place, and as we've seen today, he speaks to people like you. He seeks people like you. Repent. Confess. Believe. Be saved this hour.
If that's you, I want you to just pray with me in the stillness of your heart. Just say, Lord, it's me. I confess that I'm a sinner. I know that I've messed things up and gone astray. And so today I repent. I confess that I'm a sinner. And in faith, I ask that you would forgive me, that you would wash me clean, that you would make me new. Lord, in faith, I pray that you would help me. Lord, I thank you for your grace and your goodness, for your love, for your mercy for your patience and Lord for being a God who speaks to sinners like me Father as we close today I just thank you for being a God who still speaks a God who so clearly through the pages of scripture shows us who you speak to And Father, even when we don't measure up to that, even when we fall short of that, even when we fail, Lord, you are still willing to speak to us. Father, I pray you would speak to your people. Father, I pray you would bless them. Bless these who've gathered here. Bless their children. Bless their marriages. Father, bless their friendships and their relationships. Bless their businesses. Father, bless their health and their lives. Father, help them to go forth and be a blessing. Whether it's across an ocean or across the street, Lord, I pray that we would be a blessing. Father, use us. Forgive us. Bless us. We ask and we pray these things now. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, this is Pastor Pete. Thanks so much for watching this sermon from Cowboy Fellowship. We hope you enjoy it. I want to ask you, if you don't mind, be sure you hit the subscribe button, the like button, and then leave a comment, an encouraging word down below. All three of those things are so encouraging to us. They also help with the YouTube algorithm and help us as we're trying to get the good news out to the world. Thanks for watching this video. Thanks for being a part of our online family. We pray God blesses you today.